Here's my story. Watch his exceptional story, Pursuits by Skoda, only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning, it's bright and early on Tuesday and you're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live. I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. Asian markets are off to a weak start. Japanese markets resume trade after a 10-day break. Sentiment remains sour over the proposed tariff increase on Friday. The US administration has confirmed that it is proceeding with the proposed increase in tariffs on Chinese goods, accusing the Chinese administration of backpedaling on promises made. In earnings, ICICI Bank missed estimates in the March quarter owing to elevated provisions and increased slippages. Asset quality metrics improved on a sequential basis, though. Bharti Airtel's uh, India mobile business revenue uh, grew at the highest level in three years, while margins expanded uh, compared with the previous quarter. And Vedanta is the only nifty company scheduled to report earnings today. Let's talk about the U.S. markets to begin with. Uh, the U.S. market stocks ended in the red but sharply off the day's low. Benchmark indices had in fact opened with cuts of as much as 2% after President Trump's tariff tweets sent markets tumbling across the globe. The Dow Jones had plunged as much as 450 points at one point uh, in yesterday's session. News that the Chinese delegation will still travel to Washington to continue the negotiations is what sparked the recovery. Ed Ludlow of Bloomberg News wraps up the trading action on Wall Street in this report. A threat from President Trump on tariffs really changed the tone on Monday, bringing a risk-off sentiment across financial markets in the U.S. We saw a sell-off in U.S. equities during early Monday trading after President Trump tweeted on Sunday night threatening to more than double tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. And you look at where that sell-off came. It was principally companies, semiconductors and the likes of Apple have a big exposure to China that bore the brunt of that sell-off. In terms of where we ended the day, though, U.S. equities did come back. The S&P 500, the main gauge of U.S. equities, closed down half a percent but had fallen as much as 1.6% earlier during Monday's session. Likewise with the Dow Jones, closed down a quarter of a percent but had fallen as much as 1.8%. And then tech really impacted. We saw the Nasdaq had the biggest drop of 2.2% earlier on Monday but closed down just half a percent. It's worth mentioning the VIX as well. The gauge of stock volatility had its biggest increase of the year. And that also, that risk sentiment, that risk off sentiment did translate to the bond markets. We saw the yield on the US 10 year Treasury fall by around five basis points to 2.48 percent, but then came back rising a little to two and a half percent. Commodities also were roiled by those Trump tweets. We saw everything from cotton to fo uh, corn futures slump and soybean contracts uh, hit particularly hard, had their biggest slump in nine months. A bigger picture take on commodities, the Bloomberg Commodity Index fell 1.1%, but again, paired some of those losses to close down, close down half a percent. It's worth noting also oil, WTI crude, had been in negative territory for most of the day, but rose throughout the afternoon to around a gain of 1.5%. And then in the currency space, broadly speaking, the US dollar was weaker against its major peers after that news. As with all risk-off markets, we saw haven assets like the yen make gains, the yen stronger against the dollar. And likewise, gold, also some modest gains in gold, up two-tenths of one percent. We have another round of trade talks later this week. Chinese Vice Premier Liu He is due in Washington. The, the latest is that they, those talks will go ahead. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, we get trade data from China and the U.S. respectively. So markets very focused on the status of those negotiations between the U.S. and China when it comes to trade. For Bloomberg News, Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Well, uh, one commentator has described uh, the latest action, in fact, in equity markets yesterday as a synchronous cross-asset uh, rush to the exits. But everybody is going to be watching uh, the negotiations that are slated to take place between uh, Chinese authorities and, of course, uh, U.S. negotiators later this week. Have a look at the latest uh, in terms of what uh, the street is expecting, what really uh, Bloomberg is hearing. Uh, here's Sean Donnan uh, with the latest report. 
What we're hearing from the U.S. side, and this comes from Bob Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, is that they still expect uh, Lu He to lead a delegation uh, to here to Washington on Thursday. Some other folks we're talking to, however, are raising some questions about that. Uh, if the Chinese delegation, and in particular Lu He, were to arrive here on, on Thursday, just hours before these tariffs uh, were to take place, it could be a real uh, tough position for them to be in, uh, and potentially a very embarrassing position for them at home. Well, uh, Sean, uh, Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin also said this deal was 90 percent done. Does it seem a bit unusual to trash it all now? Or is this just a bargaining tactic? Did you get any sense uh, from that uh, media briefing that there is a way forward? I think the way a lot of people greeted yesterday's tweets from the president was to think that this was a tactic to, to raise uh, the pressure on the Chinese before they came to town. But what really became apparent just in the past hour, as you say, in this off-camera briefing uh, by Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, and Stephen Mnuchin, is that there were some pretty fundamental differences, and that there had been, in the U.S., from the U.S.'s perspective, a fundamental change in the Chinese position. That change, we're told, is really that the Chinese all of a sudden had decided that they. They could not enshrine into law uh, measures on forced technology transfers and other issues. Uh, neither uh, Ambassador Lighthizer nor Secretary Mnuchin would detail exactly what the issues were, but we're told it's a series of major issues. Uh, that is uh, not a good sign in terms of these negotiations. If just a few hours ago the markets here in the United States were taking hope uh, or were hoping that this was just a negotiating tactic. I think the mood clearly has changed in the last couple of hours, and we really are looking at a much harder road back to an agreement. All right. Now, uh, I told you before we started speaking about these negotiations that uh, the markets were roiled yesterday, and you probably saw that in India. The Asian markets, particularly uh, in China, uh, were very badly hit. So we're going to get a, a very uh, detailed update on how the markets are looking now. But for now, let's turn to the Indian market. Uh, Agam Vakil is here to tell you about the day's trade and what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, yesterday, FIs were net sellers uh, to a large extent. Uh, from the numbers that I saw, at least the provisional numbers indicate 750 crores approximately was yeah. sold. That was across the board. Uh, how are we looking at today, though? Well, again, it could be another day of where we could see volatility coming through, Alex, because we are, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, globally. And, uh, of course, uh, the wicks in the Indian markets is extremely high. For now, there's a little bit of respite when it comes to the SGX Nifty. But we did see a lot of weakness in the indices yesterday. 1% decline for the benchmark with the mid-cap and the small, small cap indices following suit. And the banking indices also saw just as much weakness, but perhaps a little more. Uh, but uh, how are your ADRs doing at this point in time? Weakness sustains for Tata Motors, HDFC Bank and Vedanta. And uh, we will also have Vipro, Infosys and Dr. Reddy's on the other hand, actually, which advance in trade. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, your uh, well, FI's uh, numbers are concerned, You've seen a, a sell number of around 950 odd crores. On the other hand, just about 90 odd crores coming in from the DII stable. So selling there, and this was evident and this was expected considering the weakness that we saw across the globe. But when it comes to your contributors, it was essentially the HDFC twins along with Reliance Industries bearing down on the indices. But moving on to your futures and options space, we saw some selling with an increase of as much as 1.7% in OI for the Nifty and the bank Nifty futures saw an increase of nearly 2%. As far as your open interest is concerned, in options, we're seeing a lot of writing around the 11,700, 11,800 calls. But uh, that said, we're seeing a lot of change in OI, and the most active option now is around the 12,000 mark, the 12,000 calls specifically. Uh, let's move on and talk about uh, your WIX. This one, this time around, has risen another 10%. Can we see the wicks come off to a certain extent? Well, that's a wait and watch. But there, this, we have seen a considerable expansion in option premiums because of which the wicks is up now at around 26.4. Uh, moving on, let's also address what's going on with the Nifty. That's at around 1.3, I guess 1.5. And uh, we're also uh, looking at, uh, of course, it's a PCR, but we're also keeping an eye on Jet Airways, which is now in the FNO band. 
And besides Jet Airways, we have, uh, well, Bharti Etar, which was quite active yesterday in trade, HBCL and PC Jeweler in terms of increase in open interest. And as far as unwinding is concerned, keeping an eye on something like a Raymond, Ajanta Pharma and Mindtree. So again, while we did see mixed moves from stocks, uh, all eyes will remain on the index of whether or not we could see some consolidation come through. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Well, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the Asian markets. Uh, yesterday, the Chinese markets uh, were in focus across the globe. Everyone was talking about it. Uh, the fact that the major indices uh, crashed as much as 5% in some cases. Uh, this morning, it seems to be a bit of a relief or, or you know, moving upwards from that uh, uh, mark, despite the uh, negative news on the tariffs that you, you got overnight and the fact that the U.S. indices uh, uh, the futures at least are indicating room for a further downside. Let me take you through some of those numbers. That the Chinese benchmarks are up uh, between 0.4 and 0.8 percent. The Hang Seng as of now is up about six tenths of a percent. The Nikkei as we told you is playing catch up and therefore it's, it's down about one percent. But uh, don't look at that uh, as an indicator of how the market is doing. The Chinese markets and the Hang Seng are what you have to look at in terms of what is indicating the broad trend uh, about how uh, the markets are looking in Asia. And uh, as Agam told you, the SGX Nifty is indicating a positive uptick as of now. A lot can change uh, before the markets open here in India at 9 o'clock. But uh, let's take you through what's making headlines across the globe. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. The Federal Reserve, which is stepping up its warning about corporate debt, saying the market expanded 20% last year and that lending standards are continuing to slide. The Fed's biannual financial stability report says businesses with the biggest existing debt are also the ones taking on the riskiest loans. It also adds that protections lenders include in case borrowers default are continuing to erode. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, meanwhile, is refusing the latest attempt to obtain six years of President Trump's personal tax returns. Writing to the House Ways and Means chairman, he said the Democrats' request, quote, lacks a legitimate legislative purpose and therefore Trump is not authorized or he is not authorized on Trump's behalf to disclose the requested tax returns. The Democrats could now pursue more forceful measures such as a subpoena. Iran is signaling it may scale back some of its commitments under the 2015 nuclear deal in response to growing pressure from the U.S. Now, a senior government official says Tehran does not plan to abandon the accord, as President Trump has, but may make minor reductions to some of its obligations. The official adds that EU leaders have been informed and President Rouhani will make the announcement on Wednesday. Former Goldman Sachs banker Roger Ng has been granted bail in the U.S. and placed under house arrest ahead of his trial over the scandal at Malaysian state investment fund 1MDB. Ng, seen there in the blue shirt, arrived in New York on Monday morning and appeared in federal court the same day. He pled not guilty to charges he broke American anti-bribery laws and conspired to launder money that was embezzled from the fund. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and at TikTok, on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Sue Keen and this is Bloomberg. The reported numbers uh, look below estimates. Uh, the profit number has come in at 969 crore rupees, and the expectation was that it will be in excess of 2200 crores. So on a reported basis, the numbers look below estimates, but on an adjusted basis, the numbers look pretty decent. The net interest income figure came in at 7620 crore rupees, which, which was a growth of about 27% on a YY basis, but it was slightly um, above expectations, mainly on the back of uh, a one-off income on account of uh, interest on an income income tax refund. So if you net that off, the numbers, um, the NIR numbers were also in line with the expectations and the profit was below expectations mainly because of the higher provisioning that the bank made. In this quarter, one sugar account uh, company mentioned in the press release that slipped, that they've classified it as an NPA and overall they've made higher provisioning during the quarter to the tune of about 5,451 crore rupees versus about 42-44 crore rupees on a sequential basis. Their overall provisioning coverage ratio has gone up to 80 
60% versus 60.5% on a YY basis and their overall asset quality also improved during the quarter with gross NPAs coming down to about 6.7% versus 7.75% on a sequential basis and net NPAs coming in at about 2.06% versus 2.58% on a sequential basis. So net NPAs for them were lowest in the 13 quarters. Their slippages were slightly higher than expectations mainly because of the one sugar account coming in at about 3547 crore rupees and upgrades were 1522 and there were write-offs um, to the tune of about 7300 crore piece which was slightly on the higher side operationally the numbers look largely in line with the expectations with an operating profit of about 62 33 crore piece margins as well looked pretty decent in fact there was an expansion to about 3.72 percent versus 3.4 percent on a sequential basis this again was led by the one-off uh, um, refund that we saw on uh, the income tax refund that the company saw due during the quarter, fee income growth 15% and some of the other operational metrics, um, their loan growth was 15%, domestic growth about 16%. So overall, um, pretty decent uh, set of numbers coming in from ICICI Bank. If you net off uh, the one-offs and some of the practices that the bank took, uh, took to during this quarter. Well, Bharti Airtel for the fourth quarter has reported a strong set of numbers. On the consolidated basis, if we see the company's revenue was higher by nearly 2% to close to 20,600 crore rupees, while the EBITDA jumped nearly 6.7% to close to 6,600 crore rupees. Now, this is the highest uh, EBITDA growth that the company has reported in the last 12 quarters. Now, this was aided by lower other expenses, lower sales and marketing expenses, and a lower employee cost. Now, the company's margins expanded by nearly 145 basis points to close to 32.2%. Now, this is the highest margin expansion reported by the company in at least the last 14 quarters. Lastly, the company's net profit that was high by nearly 24% to close to 107 crore rupees, mainly aided by the exceptional gains of close to 2,000 crore rupees, which was related to the cost and reassessment of levies, uh, reassessment of other tariffs that aided the bottom line. Now, uh, the, due to the ongoing rights issue, the company has not shared any details related to the subscriber base, its ARPU numbers and the 4G subscribers. But if you see segment-wise, the India mobile business revenue stood out in this quarter as it grew nearly 4.3 percent to close to 10,600 crore rupees versus 10,200 reported by the company in the last quarter. Now, the rising share of 4G users on its network must have aided the company's India mobile business revenue. Now, the India mobile business EBIT losses also contracted to 1,378 crore rupees and this could be because of higher ARPU that the company has been generating from its 4G users. Lastly, the company's finance cost, now that increased by nearly 30 percent to close to 2,500 100 crore rupees due to higher debt. Now, its debt, that is the net debt position, increased by nearly 6 percent to close to 1,12,700 crore rupees, while its leverage ratio uh, increased to 4.37 times from 4.28 times in the last quarter. Vedanta you would be coming out with numbers today, but you're not uh, typically expecting a good quarter coming out of the company year on year basis at least. Uh, a top line growth, we're expecting a downtick of as much as 18.5%, and the number that we're working with is around 22,500 odd crore as compared to 27,630 odd crore that the company registered. Bottom line performance is also expected to slip as much as 69% or 70% year on year basis. And in terms of operational performance, that is expected to, uh, that is seen down by as much as 23% as compared to 6,000 at a number of around 6,000 uh, compared to 7,800 that the company registered in the corresponding quarter. Margins are expected to shrink to as much as 27% as compared to 29% in the corresponding quarter. But then, however, in totality, YY numbers may just not be comparable on account of the inclusion of steel division out there. But then, just detailing out the numbers and seeing the kind of performance that we are expecting from this quarter, uh, I'll start off with zinc business first because it contributes to around 45 to 47 percent of Vedanta's overall consolidated EBITDA. That number, as we know, Zinc India has reported a good 23 percent decline in the operational performance of the company. International business volumes too seem to be impacted by the strike at Scorpion Refinery for 15 days in the quarter four itself. Net net, we're not looking at good picture from Zinc business as a whole. Iron ore division, which too contributes substantially to EBITDA, however, is expected to report higher. Uh, or higher EBITDA as much as 13% jump out there on account of higher contribution from Karnataka mines. 
Copper division that continues to make uh, continues to be a loss making entity due to the closure of Sterlite plant. Aluminium division we expecting a downtick there to 93 percent downtick coming in on that division on account of higher cost to produce and lower LME prices which are expected to weigh down on the financials of aluminium business. Power division though we are expecting a downtick of as much as 35 percent but then that might just so you know throw up some surprise given that uh, the PAF for TSPL uh, stands at around 88 percent in this quarter as compared to 80 percent which was guided back in December. December quarter, uh, according to the Vedanta's uh, press release or Vedanta's uh, presentation. Uh, on account of that, we might just see some surprise uh, coming in from the power division as a whole and oil and gas division, which again is a major contributor, contributing to around 30% of the financial. That is seeing higher. Uh, we are expecting an uptick coming in from the oil and gas division as much to the tune of 31% year on year basis. And a couple of things actually we'd like to watch out from apart from the earnings is the progress of a Gamsberg mine and the Fumer project. Apart from that, we'll be looking at the cost input pressures for aluminum division given the bauxite availability for the business as an issue overall. Uh, Vedanta resource, uh, the, the parent company Zambian issue with the farmers over foreign land. Apart from that, the, uh, the long pending plea related to Tutu current case and slew of exits that the company has been seeing from oil and gas division and if at all, if we could further get some clarity from the management thereon and the moment and the outlook that the, that, that the company is suggesting for base metal prices. There are a number of stocks making news today, starting with results. Marico came in with numbers that were below estimates. Their revenues are up 9% at 1,609 crores. Net profit is up two times at 406 crores. EBITDA is up 12% at 283 crores. And margins stand at 17.6% compared to 17% last year. The net profit is higher on account of tax adjustments worth 188 crore rupees. And the India volume Volume growth stands at 8%. Then we have Walkard, which came in with in line to strong numbers. Their revenues are down 4% at 979 crores. Net loss is at 14 crores versus 153 crores. EBITDA is at 35 crores versus an EBITDA loss last year of 30 crores. And there was a deferred tax reversal of 36 crores in the current quarter. The raw material as a percentage of sales is at 21% versus 25%. The board approves raising 1500 crore rupees via equity and also recommends reappointment of Dr. H.F. Khorakiwala as executive chairman till February 2025. Then we have Gujarat Gas, which came in with average results. Their revenues are up 10% at 1,908 crores. Net profit is up 77% at 117 crores. EBITDA is up 14% at 254 crores. And margins stand at 13.3% versus 12.8% last year. Their other income was up 89% at 18.7 crores. HDFC Bank is considering a stock split on May 22nd. The board will consider splitting each share into two shares. Then we have Aztec Life Sciences. Uh, they withdraw the merger proposal with Godrej Agrovet. Uh, they reviewed the proposal and decided to not pursue the scheme further on the basis of interaction with multiple stakeholders across the company and Godrej Agrovet. VST Tiller's tractors April sales have gone down 29% at 721 units on a year-on-year -year basis. The Power Tiller sales are down 57% at 289 units and the tractor sales are up 23% at 432 units versus 350 units. Lastly, we have Sterlite Technologies. The promoters are going to release pledge on shares by the end of July 20, 2019.
All right, several stories available on the website BloombergPrint.com. In fact, uh, one of our viewers at there was just asking about a technical check on the markets. You'll find that at 8.30 on Indian Open. Uh, a lot more on the website, so do check that out. For now, let me take you through a couple of stories. Chief Justice of India Ranjan Gogoi got a clean chit from the Supreme Court's in-house inquiry committee headed by Justice S.A. Bobade, which has found no substance in allegations of uh, sexual harassment leveled against him by a former woman employee of the court. And over 62% of eligible citizens exercise their franchise across 51 states, uh, seats rather, in seven states during the fifth phase of the Lok Sabha polls. While West Bengal reported the highest turnout with 74%, the two seats in Jammu and Kashmir saw a turnout of less than 20%. All the phases so far have seen a turnout in excess of 60%. That's all you need to know uh, going into trade today. But do stay tuned, like I said, a lot more coming up on the other side. Uh, this is Bloomberg Quint.